We're going to get started with our um, final uh, breakout in this room. Um, and to moderate this session, I'm very pleased to welcome Jackie Chi. Uh, some of you probably know her. Um, Jackie is now Director of Programs and Special Projects for the Strategic Initiatives team here at the CIA. Um, she has been working on our team for many years. She's the Program Director of the Everything Food Conference, the ANI Initiative, um, and she's just absolutely brilliant and wonderful, and I'm so thankful that she's, she's accepted to uh, also jump in into this program. So, Jackie Chi. Thank you very much, and is everybody ready for this last breakout session of the conference? Yeah? Super excited from the last three days, plant forward stuff. Is anybody ready to talk about meat, actually? <laughs> Has somebody missed it a little bit or wondered how they're going to get their consumers or guests to actually buy into plant forward, fearing that, you know, vegan or vegetarian is maybe too scary for them? Well, this is the session for you. Um, in case you are um, missing the meat, I have an image that we're gonna show for those of you who are missing the meat. Um, this, I was just reading, and thank you to the AV team for accommodating my very last minute request. Um, just before the session, I was doing some web browsing, reading some news, um, and was reading about the story about um, concept shops in Berlin. Um, and I just found this fascinating because this is a shop that sells cushions made to look like meat. That's all they do. Just pillows and cushions that look like meat. Here's the kicker and why it's still appropriate for Global Plant Forward is because the person who actually makes the cushions has been a vegetarian for 13 years. So I feel like it just shows that there is a place for everything that we can embrace um, plant forward and recognize also that plant forward again is not just about vegan and vegetarian certainly encompasses that um, and I think is a great market opportunity for people who want to be embracing those consumers who are increasingly looking for those options without alienating the others who are not yet ready for that are not on that part of their journey um, and going to meet. Okay, thank you, Chad. We can take the meat cushions off the large screen now. Um, so this session is titled, What's the Right, and in quotes, or in brackets, Optional Amount of Meat for Plant Forward Dishes, Culinary Strategies to Design Sustainable, Healthful, and Delicious Menus. Um, and I'm really pleased to have, to be welcoming back to the stage uh, many of the presenters, or or three of the presenters that you've already seen um, in the general session. So I'll keep my remarks um, short and allow you to embrace uh, their, this chance to have a more intimate glimpse into their thinking. Um, they're all going to be exploring the role for meat and thinking about actually uh, meat and, and maybe more appropriately uh, animal-based protein as part of the plant forward strategy. Um, so first up, I'm welcoming back uh, Joaquin Cardoso, um, who uh, uh, had talked about his approach obviously before. Um, I think we have some images also from his um, previous uh, presentation, so you can embrace that again or enjoy those again. Please help me welcome Joaquin Cardoso. And it's Joaquin's birthday, so happy birthday. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> well, thanks for this second day. For those who haven't saw me yesterday, I run seven restaurants in Mexico, and all of them are veggie, veggie, veggie, vegetable sided. We try to do them. When we opened Carlota, journalists love to ask this question, what kind of cuisine you're doing? And we had a very of time to respond them. It was in French, it was in Mexican, it was in modern. I didn't knew I was, it was my first project as a chef. I didn't know what I was doing. So I love to answer with a concept. I, lo I love to answer them, I'm doing healthy food. But not understanding healthy as a regime or a dietary concept. I like to embrace a little bit more beyond the plate. So we tried to know where we're going to get our supplies, know our producers, the meat we're, we're getting, the fish we are serving. So now we have a compromise of these little 
fish supplier that we get all the fish no matter what size, no matter what species we're getting. Mm. So we're change, constantly changing what's on the plate. If we want to do vegetables, we want it to be as close as possible to the city. So we talk about Jolka and Elena and I, I think we th both think the same. And that's what, how I kind of uh, quit that question with the journalist. <laughs> what are you doing about healthy cuisine? Because I didn't knew what to answer, mainly. So under this way of thinking, in Carlota we serve around four ounces of fish, poultry, or meat in mains. That's like a third or a half of what all restaurants, or most of the restaurants in Mexico City are serving. For starters, we are serving two and a half. And in that way, that allows us to serve, by example, a lunch menu, three courses, for underneath $15, with the same high quality protein. I mean, not choosing tenderloin or T-bone or what everybody's choosing, but like the, for us, high quality protein is how you breathe or how you fed or how you get these ones. You know? To, in order to achieve that, we have to give a twist to the, to the garnish and with a very heavy protein, like vegetable side. That's how we do it. Mm. By example, in Merida, we do a roasted sweet potato with a sickle pack made from local dry shrimp. Sickle pack is a Mayan sauce made with roasted tomato, a pasote, pumpkin seeds, and we add this dry shrimp to give an extra umami to the recipe. And we can put only like three big shrimps and that's it. People don't complain, people like it. In Monterrey, where she's like a big, big consumer of meat, like huge, like, oh, kind of a Texas style. They are close. We open a restaurant and we're doing this hash brown with a very famous chicharron from a local butchery called La Ramos, made out of pork jaw deep fried and we add it to the mix and then we add like a creme grelette with a pickled chiltepin. Mm. So that's how we are doing to in incorporate some animal like seasonings to our vegetable forward dishes. In Mexico City we do this ixo sauce made out from crickets mm. and we put it what on tomatoes or vegetables, broccolini, what's on season? Porcelain, we like to go change that like very often. We have done like a flash roasted kale salad with a local longaniza, it looks like a sausage, smoked sausage from Valladolid. So we use the rendered fat to season the, the, the, the kale and use the sausage meat as well. So in that case we use very little and carnivores are not missing that feeling. I like to think that we are like agents of change. Like I said, I have the responsibility to run seven restaurants and a lot of you people probably are on catering or institutional restaurants or little operations, probably a sushi restaurant that goes only 12 people a night. But I think that we are the ones who decide what our customers are eating and how. And the proportion of animal protein that we are getting. I think that's something to think about and I let you this idea. I think we are responsible for the future days. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm gonna start cooking. I'm gonna do my first recipe. As I say, I like to steal ideas from other countries like the Ixo sauce mm -hmm. and try to do a Mexican way. This is beef. Yeah, we have to use beef in the hotel. We have an hamburger. And if we have to use beef, we have to know where. So we found this producer in Durango, this girl, Paola Mares, and we know how she, she feds her animals, how he, she kills them, how they're growing. It's a Wagyu cross with Angus, black Angus, to, that's because it's very, very warm in Durango, mm -hmm. so they needed to cross it. And we smoke it, and this is only two and a half ounces of meat, and for a tartare that is mainly like 98% of meat, 
we achieved to do a tartar that's probably the half. So we had like sprouted and cooked wheat berries. We like to use this buckwheat, hemp, sprouted lentils. And I say, I, I stole this idea from Mediterranean. So this looks like, for us, it's a tabule. We wanted to do a tabule of a sprouted and nice, nutritious seeds. I like to think in that way, like I said yesterday, like in culinary school, they teach us recipes, not techniques for vegetables. So if you think a, a gazpacho is a technique, not a recipe, like you can do a gazpacho of almost anything, like a tropical fruit from Colombia, beets, cherries, uh, tabule is the same, ceviche is the same. I, I did a carrot ceviche. So that's a, like a way to inspire us in Carlota. So I'm gonna add some lime. Some lime here too. Olive oil. Some sugar. This is um, sesame roasted seed oil, like the Japanese kind of style. And this is very simple. This beef has been it's cold smoked. What we do in Carlota is that we talk with our producer and we don't buy tenderloin. That's going to be so expensive for a Wagyu. So we use the parts like nobody's buying for her. Mm -hmm. In that way, we can achieve to have like not very high price items in the menu and very good quality protein, as I say. That's quality protein for us. So this goes here. Very simple. And do you describe this on the menu as a beef tartare, or do you provide any additional yeah, explanation? I put yeah. it like that. I mean, in Mexico, by law, you have to put the weight of the proteins. Oh. So I put it, nobody has it. We had a few complaints at the beginning. I think now people who like to eat this way are our customers. And then, like I say, it's a hotel. So tourist seems to appreciate. Anne was there, so she can <laughs> tell us. So this is super, super Middle Eastern inspired. I think Musa is going to do something very similar. And can I ask, Joaquin, what, what I find very interesting about the way you're plating it now is actually the beef is on the bottom it's as opposed to on the top. Yeah. Was that a conscious decision for you? I wanted people eat it like I, I always plate thinking of how people will eat it. Mm -hmm. I'm, not mm -hmm. think, I'm not plating thinking how it's going to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think I want the people eat it that way. Mm -hmm. I want to have the half of the seeds and the beef. So that's how we played in this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good point. Mm -hmm. So this is a roasted aubergine puree. We, roast, we have a wood oven in Carlota, so we burn it on the, over the, the burning logs the embers, and then we just puree with some olive oil, cherry vinegar, and salt. Super simple. Then we're gonna garnish this with some spring onion. We stole it from Mediterranean, so we are in Chile, mm -hmm. San Serrano rims, because we like it like that in Mexico. And 
we finish with some of the same mix of herbs that we're using here, like coriander, mint, parsley. This tartar has been changing, like we have done it with Ixo sauce, we have done it with, we I do one in another restaurant with peppers, and I use, usually use the same quantity of meat every time. Mm. We even use that quantity for ceviches. <laughs> and what made you decide four ounces for an entree was the right amount of meat? Um, I think the confidence of how I like to eat mm -hmm. and the amount of meat that I think people should try and start like giving a full plate with more vegetables and mm -hmm. without ha being out of the business, you know. Mm -hmm. That's the tricky part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's it. So the second dish is a super classic in Carlota now. It's a grilled avocado. So we grab the avocado in Aja Santa and we grill it. Is this a particular um, varietal for the avocados hmm? or that you use? A particular varietal for the avocados like Haas or yeah, Huerte we avocado? Get Haas, mm -hmm. mainly. In Mexico City, it's hard to get, like, we get like this Criollo one, mm -hmm. it's thin paper skin that's very nice, but it won't work for mm -hmm. this recipe. It's Oja Santa. We have cut stripes of the Oja Santa. Do you know this? Maybe it's nice if I pass it to you. You can taste it. It, yeah. So for this dish, we got inspired because we found a goat cheese producer like 25 km from Mexico City. And she aged the goat cheese in avocado leaves mm. that you probably have smell as well. So we found that goat cheese, avocado will, will really work that way. So we put this here. Then we do a mix of greens on season. Can be mustard greens, purslain, watercress. Salt, pepper, and then we do a vinaigrette from our organic citrus that we get on season, and we do a fermented um, chili and citrus. We take all what's on season, like habaneros, limes, bergamot, mandarins, sweet limes, and we put 3% of the weight on salt and we let it outside. Mm. Like a Jusu Kosho inspired thing as well. We're stealing mm -hmm. <laughs> techniques. Mm -hmm. This is candied lemon. Very, a technique I learned when I worked with the cast, super simple. You peel the lemon, take out all the white part, blanch it three times, and then with the same juice, if you use 10 lemons, 
you squeeze 10 lemons mm -hmm. and they use like these little squares for the coffee that you love in France. So it's one square for lemon. That's the recipe. You can weigh it, it's like 20 grams of sugar. And then you can feed like super low heat until they go clear mm. and translucent. We use everything, we chop it, and we do a vinaigrette with those to season our creams. Our avocado. And then, I was talking about the goat cheese. So what we do with the goat cheese, that it's aged in avocado leaves, we blend it with hoja santa, chile, coriander, and the way of the process of the cheese making. And we got this granita, this is frozen. We Take a cheese grater and we make this kind of snow looking powder mm. that is frozen. And we put a good amount of it. So it's like an avocado goat cheese salad. So, sorry, so there's goat cheese in the granita or it's, it's the way goat. from the goat cheese? Both. Both. Whey oh, and goat cheese. And then, we like sometimes we have used smoked eel or kind of a fish roe that we have, like mullet or whatever, sometimes salmon. I mean, it's not necessary. But for those people who like animal things and salads, mm -hmm. it's like a nice contrast. And then we just finish with some nasturtium flowers all over here. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we have time for one question. If somebody has a question from the audience for Chef, where we can save it. All right. Thank you so much, Joaquin. Thank you. Um, next up, we have a dear friend of mine, um, Suvir Saran, who um, I believe you all had the pleasure of seeing this morning. Um, I actually started at the CIA about seven, almost seven years ago, and Suvir was um, one of the first chefs and presenters that I got to work with as part of this team. Um, so I was very saddened to hear, obviously, about the stroke that he had last year, but so glad to welcome him back to the stage. So please help me welcome Suvir Saran. <laughs> Uh, when I opened Devi in nine, 2001, um, I was shocked by the appalling uh, state of Indian cuisine in the world. The cuisine that I grew up eating, which was mostly plant-based, with as a vegetarian in my home, it was all plant-based. But even the homes of people that ate meat, it was meat was the condiment, vegetables, legumes, beans, grains were the celebration on the plate table. The food that I was seeing in America, the food that I was seeing as Indian, was just nothing I could have ever imagined people ingesting, let alone calling it fine. So we opened Devi, the largest portion of protein that went on a plate would be two and a half to three ounces. This was 2001, nobody was talking about plant-based cooking. And, I, uh, and we were I was the most expensive Indian restaurant in the world when we opened. A uh, plate of meat, chicken, dish would be $28, lamb chops would be $35 in 2001, and people paid because we made it look correct. The lamb chops came with potatoes that were cooked with a lot of care and love with their peel on with some onions, some lime juice, green chilies, a Bengali Bangladeshi recipe that went with a pear chutney from Himachal Pradesh in the hills of India, and the, uh, the uh, spiced chili oil from southern India, and the northern Indian uh, lamb chop. In my head, I thought, 
I have to take with each plate people through a journey of India. And interestingly enough, the uh, New York Times journalist wrote of it as that. And without hearing it from me, he said, it's like taking a train trip through India with Saran cherry picking flavors, dishes, or t textures, or temperatures of, uh, from different parts of India to bring into one plate. In India, when we think about eating, we think about chappan uh, bhog, which means 56 distinct pleasures that a person must experience at the dining table any one meal period. 56 unique experiences. So they are brought in by textual contrast, color, uh, temperature, uh, if something is uh, hot or sour or salty or acrid or uh, uh, south, uh, uh, spicy. All of these things add to those 56 experiences we must have. And that was something that was also guiding me. Meats are meat. They can give you fat and some little texture. But vegetables bring color, form, shape, uh, playfulness all to the table. This uh, first recipe we have prepared here is a salad that I uh, made because I would make it with my fried chicken that uh, became very popular. But with the fried chicken, I didn't serve the mashed potatoes that normally people eat or a gravy. I served it with this salad and it was, people were loving it. Uh, it's pineapples, there's uh, mangoes, grapefruit, oranges, depending on what you have and how much time you want to spend on supreming them or you can buy them. Nowadays you can buy everything pre-done. Um, lots of herbs that we've taken. We've taken cilantro, mint, green chilies, which aren't here, uh, lime juice, and we pureed them into a little vinaigrette. Pistachio that have been toasted. A little salt. And they go together. This becomes a cool salad. Uh, Sudexo used to have an account with Dell computers. And I believe Michael Dell used to have this with vanilla ice cream at the account because he loved <laughs> this salad so much. Um, this salad is it's, it's everything that fried food needs as a partnership on the uh, plate. It's heavy, it's um, delicious, but it tires you out after a while because you've eaten too much. This cuts all of that. And it's a celebration of all the uplifting flavors a plate of food must have. And the colors are beautiful. When the, you put the right amount of grapefruits, the dish will be brighter and a little prettier. Room temperature, chilled, with vanilla ice cream as Michael Dell does. It works in many different ways. It's a it chart, food chart in India was a, pretty much a staple around five in the evening when kids would come back from school. Two or three times a week, our mothers would give us something like this with the fruits of the season, with a little a lime or a lemon juice, chaat masala, which is a blend of Indian, the 20 plus spices that are hot, sour, salty, sweet, bitter, all in one bite. That is sprinkled on them, and kids eat it happily. Now they want to eat McDonald's. That's the fancy dining in India these days that people go on their date night to a McDonald's. Um, so that was the one uh, fun uh, thing that we put with all the fried food. The soup that we were going to talk about here is a soup called Harira, which was, um, it, when I went to Morocco and had Harira, I thought, this is like all the Indian uh, uh, curries that we all make. The word curry in India is not about a flavor, but about a saucy dish, a broti dish, a soupy dish. So the curry is not like the Thai of, uh, uh, Malaysian curries, which are green, red, masama, and the different flavor profiles. For us, a curry is a sauce. It could be a marinara sauce that we'll call pasta with a curry. Uh, this had the harira in uh, Morocco was tasty, was uh, flavorful, but I always felt it was missing something. And that was for me, Moroccan food was India light. There was something always still lacking. It was fun and playful, but I would never be sated. In the Indian meal, if it's done correctly, you do get those 56 experiences or more that haunt you for days and end, because you wonder, how did they get to that place? And so when I made the harira back in our kitchen, I had the recipe from the uh, chef in, uh, in uh, Fez, and he taught me what they did. They took the onions and they put just oil, they browned the onions, and they had uh, tomatoes, and they had the chicken, and then they had some saffron or cumin. But nobody bothered browning the uh, spices or you know, caramelizing the onions really deeply or uh, uh, grinding, grounding the, uh, grinding the saffron after toasting it. The saffron flavor, the color, they all come out much better. And when we did all of these tricks that Indians have used for spices, the dishes became completely different. And the harira, I, I guess, we, I also made uh, with Sudexa, and we would make this all over their accounts. People loved it. It's mostly chickpeas, so we have in the soup onion and 
tomatoes and spices that we've cooked for you. We've left a few chickpeas to add here, and lots, because there's equal amounts of chickpeas and uh, chicken that are going in. Uh, chicken. I also now just put uh, any kind of beans that we have, uh, that our friends from uh, California, who's uh, Rancho Gordo Farm, um, that he sends me, I put, uh, use them instead of the chickpeas. And then you just simmer it till the, uh, for 40 minutes or so, the chicken gets really soft and tender. And the soup is so easy, so reasonable, so good for you, that it's, uh, nobody's going to be missing too much chicken in this, because the flavor from the chicken is there, the flavor of the spices. We'll uh, add salt to taste, bowl full of this. Joyce Goldstein used to say to me, this is a perfect bowl full, a bowl full of comfort food. You watch a movie with it, you can just relax after a long day. It's a bowl full of deliciousness, health, wellness, and it's also good for the planet because there's such little, there's not, not too much of anything that's not good for you. And it's just brightly flavored and everything. Um, the other dish that we'll be showing here is uh, fried cauliflower and chicken. I am ashamed that my name in the New York Times, if you Google my name in the New York Times website, so we, the first 20 hits will be of uh, Manchurian cauliflower. It was a dish we all made at Devi that was chicken, cauliflower florets that were deep fried in just an egg and cornstarch slurry. We fried it till it was crispy. Then I took ketchup which had been made jammy using some garlic and cayenne pepper, nothing more. And we cook it down till it's really sticky in the pan. And then we toss those uh, coated cauliflowers into the sauce. Sam Sifton, the editor of the Food Pages, it's his favorite dish to bake. And he thinks anybody who hates vegetables will start licking their fingers and biting into them because the sauce is so delicious. Ketchup, garlic, and uh, cayenne pepper. I'm ashamed. That's the first dish that got famous. But again, you can we, in India, they made it with chicken. They make it with uh, paneer, which is Indian uh, cheese, cauliflower, and a lot of other vegetables. You could use any vegetables for them. This sauce will make people eat uh, this, these vegetables very happily. At Disney, they do a party for the senses during the Food and Wine Festival every fall. And for three years, they made me do this dish because the people, audience had voted their favorite dish in the party of senses where people were doing caviar and all kinds of fanciful animal proteins. They would, the ladies would come and tell the chefs that my husband never eats vegetables, but he's eating them again and again like chicken wings. So it's a great way to have people eat plant-based uh, protein without um, worrying about bad calories, uh, the flavor not being uh, there. Um, can I help you with this? I'm so sorry, my arms are not functioning very well. But um, the, it's all about just tossing them till it gets sticky. The fried chicken that we used to have at Devi, I also then, in the winter, called sticky fried chicken, and we put tamarind into the sauce, and then made this a little darker, richer in flavor, and the tanginess of tamarind made it, people loved it as a little difference to the fried chicken. It was uh, inspired by the Korean fried chicken that people in New York were going crazy about. I said, what can India do that would match that? Uh, just a little more kick of heat and a little more sourness, and tamarind did the trick. Um, we have a baked version of this over here, which is uh, Manchurian cauliflower baked in the oven. It was the same sauce, the cauliflower tossed in it, put in the oven, forget about it, an hour later you get that. And kids will eat it. I get le letters from people from all over the country that have followed Sam Shifton in the Times, but then bought the book and seen the baked version. It's amazing, and I'm told by, the, by a lady at Harvard, Kathy McManus, who does Brigham and Women's Nutrition, that it was off the charts, it's very good for you with ketchup. So these are simple recipes that go a long way and show the ingenuity of Indian minds where with poverty they were thinking of eating vegetables rather than just uh, meats. So they made vegetables more tasty for kids. The uh, other dish we have in mind to talk about was the meatloaf, which is, oh sorry, you're going to do this. So I'll tell you the meatloaf story and then we'll show you the ingredients. There's a man called Jerry Falwell and he has a, a church where they don't invite people like me or who either worship like me or who are of my uh, uh, gay uh, family. So I'm not somebody he has in his head. But somehow my uh, meatloaf made it to the cover of Allen Brothers. It's a big steak uh, selling catalog. They bought this recipe from me. They put it into their uh, catalog. It became very successful. They made it the cover of their catalog one year. 
Jerry Falwell put this on his show and called it the best meatloaf he'd ever eaten in America. And I said to my good friend Gail Green at New York Magazine, I said, Gail, what do I do? That man who hates me and everything about my people said my meatloaf is the best thing. She said it's the most delicious punishment for him. When he realizes it's a gay man and a Hindu, idolatrous Hindu, making that meatloaf, he'll rot. <laughs> Power of food. When you do something, <laughs> the poor man was eating a gay man's meatloaf and calling it the best thing he'd ever eaten. So um, it's this again. Oh yeah. So now we have the ingredients for it: meat, mushrooms, peppers, onions. Go together. Equal amounts of mushrooms and uh, meat. We just cook them down, brown them, brown them, brown them. There's garam masala. There's toasted cumin. There's cayenne pepper. There's uh, two times cayenne pepper goes into the meat as well. And then uh, Parmigiano Reggiano. It's the, you know, umami, umami, umami, we keep talking about that. But the Parmigiano also gives a little moistness to the meatloaf that otherwise can, as forgiving as meatloaf is, a great meatloaf is a thing of dreams come true. The, uh, the lady from uh, Splendid Table, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the lady who runs it, uh, I'm forgetting her name, she said, it's a, she said your meatloaf is for midnight cravings. And she took my meat, meatloaf and she made it into meatballs. A, a, an idea she gave me, now when I catered or done uh, meatloaf at the restaurant, we make it into polpatini, like small little meatballs, and serve them as an appetizer. And I, then I trick people into half meatballs and half our vegetables that have been minced and formed into a meatball-like consistency, and then tossed in the same tamarind and uh, tomato ketchup sauce. So people are eating one with meat, one with vegetables, and nobody is, uh, they actually I love them both. So it cuts the meat in even further in half. <laughs> so you have one meatloaf that's all vegetarian, one meatball that's all vegetarian, the other is half meat, half vegetables. And the sauces for the uh, meatloaf and the vegetables are pretty much the same. This is ketchup and garlic and some cayenne pepper. The meatloaf has even tamarind put in it. So it's a tamarind glazed meatloaf. Allen Brothers thought tamarind would be the buzzword that Americans would go crazy for, and they did. So they, they call it the tamarind glazed meatloaf. Writing, verbiage, how you sell your menus, how you sell your ideas, one of the most important things you can do. When we were opening Devi, the one thing I knew was that after going to all the Indian restaurants and all the names being, in, the names that the Indian owners and chefs put to their dishes were bastardized versions of some names that never existed even in India. And so they'd made up these epic uh, sounding names that talked about some part of Indian history that never existed, and Americans would read them and think, oh, they didn't know what they were looking at. So we simplified and just called uh, braised ginger chicken or, or, or green beans with a coconut, green bean and coconut stir fry, very plain English, and people were comfortable reading it, people bought into the menu, and it was easy. So I think we were, uh, I realized that I found the menu so hard to read, why would an American who's not grown up in India, speaking the Indian languages, how would they find it welcoming? The less you uh, share, the better. I think one of the questions asked was, when should one stop adding to a dish, or when, how do you edit dishes? And I think that's the most difficult thing we can do in our lives. It's very easy to keep making things more difficult, but that doesn't make them better. And as artists, as chefs, as uh, people who are creative, it's the most important thing you can do is to edit your big, lofty ideas and make them into something that's succinct, uh, sellable and also noteworthy. Because that just adding 20 more ingredients doesn't mean that the dish will become that much more loved by everybody that eats it. So think twice before adding extra dishes. When it's there, trust yourself and your taste buds and believe in you. I always tell people if the food has to have me say, this is nice, you're lying. If, you're, if you moan and have, ooh, your body is dancing, then you've done it right. So if it, with two ingredients or ten, when you get to that moment where your body is telling you something is wonderful, stick to that, not to your brain telling you it's lovely. That's cerebral cooking. So the sauces have thickened and gotten jammy for the uh, cauliflower. And yes, this is a very important thing that happens. The vinegar in the ketchup starts hitting your nose. So that's when you know it's perfect jammy consistency. I hate this dish. So I'm, <laughs> now, now that I'm cooking, it's ruined my own reputation for me. <laughs> I am ashamed of myself by making this dish. I'm embarrassed that anybody ever makes it when it's very popular. But this, all you have to do is toss it in the sauce 
And my arms are so horrible. Please, please. Sorry, I don't know what to do. Just toss it one more time. It should be just barely coating the uh, breading, the, the fried chicken or cauliflower. You don't want them to get too soggy. And people will eat it because it's candy. That sauce has become sweet and delicious and sour and a little spicy. Your lips start tingling and burning a little, so you go back for more. And that's the trick to it. It's like, doesn't, what's the Chinese takeout general sauce chicken? That's right. something similar, but I think it's a little, this may be even easier and more, uh, less noteworthy than that. And I'm so sorry, but it's very popular. This chicken was Mark Bitchman, the New York Times minimalist. He asked me, Sweet, can we do some animal protein version of that cauliflower? I said, why? Mm. He said, I want to give people an option. I feel in India, they make it with chicken too, and I made it for him, and he loved it. He said, oh, I can eat this in, all day long, but now he's become all vegan. <laughs> but it's, yeah. Sweet, I have a question for you. You've Ask spent me. many years in America mm. bringing Indian flavors to American cooking and sort of, um, I think, amplifying flavor for American cooking. You've been spending a lot more of your time recently in India. Um, what, what does that transition look like for the modern Indian population? Very scary. Yeah, <laughs> especially, uh, and, and especially if you could sort of address, you know, we, we know that a lot of global cuisines actually have very little emphasis on animal-based protein traditionally, um, but with sort of more globalization of culture, that their intake of animal-based protein is actually going up. How do you kind of balance that? You know, when I went to school in India, we, we were told protein was vegetables, grains, beans, legumes, and meat with all proteins. It's changing. Today's young generation, the millennials and younger, uh, refuse to think of vegetables as protein. They've picked up the American jargon of animal protein being protein, and the rest of it is just food. So all these young kids who want to go to the gym and build their bodies, oh, I'm going to eat chicken. Three times a day they're eating four to eight ounces of chicken three times a day. So my mother summed it up beautifully. She said, affluenza is killing India. Mm. So as you get richer, you uh, stop using your brain and you use your wallet and you show off. It's the, let's show everybody we have money, we've arrived. And that's the sadness that's hitting India. I think worldwide, if, as people have gone through that cycle of life, America is learning from its bad choices that we have to become better. India is following in the same footsteps without learning from their, our mistakes. India is copying our uh, mistakes and not learning from what America has learned already. So it's, just, it's very sad. I'm, I was in America at the wrong time, and I'm now in India at the wrong time. So <laughs> <laughs> I like to be at the wrong time because I like to be the one person who's doing something different. But I wish I would not be in India right now because it's a very difficult market. Mm -hmm. It's a market with no heart and soul. It's a market with almost no, they don't have a calling card that they can call their desire, their passion, their love. It's all about money and fickleness. It's a very sad time. It was like America was when I arrived in America in 1993. New York City was lost. Delhi is lost right now. So, Well, I'm sure India is happy to have you back now, given all of that. I have, don't, I won't go that far, but so the soup, the soup is done, the saffron that we added is, you can smell it here, and the trick that I'll leave you all with, with saffron, I haven't shared it in my, it's in the new book, but I toast it till it's the reddish maroon strands become coffee brown, not black, and at that point you literally put them into a cold plate so don't cook any further, and you grind them into a fine powder with a mortar and pestle, if you add oil, water, or milk to that powder, you'll get the brightest orange color that you've ever seen. Years ago, there was a CIA conference on Spain where we had the uh, gentlemen from the saffron growing region. Uh, they came here and they were part of this, they were sponsors. And he saw me doing this, he said to me, who taught you that, who taught you that? I said, I'm a chef in India. Nobody knows it. I said, I, you see, I know it. And he said to me, don't ever share it. I said, why? He said, that's how we get that bright color. And our home, when our chefs would cook these dishes, the people would be worried that my mother's putting paint on the dishes. That bright orange color comes from doing that one trick. And it's just three to four minutes of roasting them on the, in a plain a frying pan, dry roasting, grinding into a powder, adding whatever liquid you want to use. The saffron is as pure and brilliant as it gets. So that's, in India, it's all about adding flavors, spices, aromatics at the right time. You finish the soup with a little cilantro, a little lemon juice. You want the brightness of the lemon, the herbaceous uh, deliciousness of the cilantro. 
if you don't like cilantro, don't put it, put green chilies, put uh, you know, shavings of uh, turnips, something fresh and crunchy and light that hasn't been cooking for a while, just to add contrast and also you eat with your eyes before you eat with my food. If I had the slides, you would, I feel ashamed of my uh, mental condition, which is aphasia, where we forget to do anything we want to do. So if I want to really do something, my brain won't let me send the message back. So um, I had beautiful slides to show that the food can be Indian, can be as chic as food can be chic, and yet be full of flavor and full of health. And the best compliment I got from my last restaurant was from Walt Billet, who was at the Harvard School of Public Health, and Walt ate the gentleman, Indian gentleman steak au poivre. And I was very worried putting this dish on the menu. It was 120 dollars for a three ounce piece of A5 Wagyu beef. But then on the plate were it was a vegetable baklava which had a beet puree in the middle of the three layered baklava. The top layer was um, wilted greens and the bottom was tomato confit. And in the filo that we had made the baklava with, I put fresh herbs between two sheets of filo and put it in the oven so that they would look, they look like painted uh, papers that were holding these vegetables together. And on the other side, we had all the roasted root vegetables and then uh, fresh black pepper in the sauce, in the steak au sauce, and three ounces of meat. And Walt got up and he said, this is 4th of July, fireworks on the plate, and I can tell you this is good for you, Sumir. I said, why is, why is it good for you? It's beef. He said, beef with that many vegetables? Perfect. So it's, you can make it happen. You, we have to believe in what we are, we are doing, and we have to believe in our own lives and that lives matter tomorrow. So please cook the old-fashioned way, and you'll be a better... Uh, leaders of the food industry and uh, feeders of the people that uh, rely on you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Suvir. Um, and I, I, I am still astonished that, you know, Suvir is saying he's recovering from a stroke, but he still has an immense amount of energy and passion. So thank you to him for sharing that. So for our final uh, presentation, for our final culinary demo, I'm um, pleased to welcome back to the stage Musa and his, um, and his assistant, Barack. And I actually just want to share a story. I was talking to Barack, actually, I should back up just a moment. Um, I mentioned that Suvir was one of the first chefs that I worked with when I first came to the CIA almost seven years ago. Um, so was Musa, actually. He was presenting at our Worlds of Flavor conference, um, and, and Barack was there along with him. I was just talking to Barack and Musa about their friendship, um, and Barack was telling me that it started at a CAA conference, actually, that Barack was attending a conference, got to meet Musa, talk to him, and from there, their friendship, their partnership, crossing Turkey and the United States has persisted. And I think that was, Barack, how many years ago? 2003. Think, 2003, that that happened. So really pleased to welcome them back to the stage. Thank you again. We're going to present two dishes today. One is eggs with uh, fava beans. It's again prepared with uh, olive oil. In the traditional recipe, there is no meat. Baklanın yapıldığı dönem aslında şu, şu, bu, bugünler için değil. Daha çok Şubat, e, Mart aylarında bakla körpeyken henüz. So e, uh, they like to do it at their restaurant in uh, February and March when the favas are smaller and tender. Ve bu, bu dönemde hemen hemen e, bakla krizi tutar. Sadece o dönem yenilen bir yemek. It's consumed that, uh, in that period, during February and uh, March, usually. Every family, during those months, prepared. My mom used to prepare this very beautifully. Baklanın bir başka özelliği var. Eğer iyi pişmediği zaman, when the, there's another thing about the fava beans, when does it, it doesn't cook properly or cook enough. Kültürümüzdeki yeri e, baklanın ruhunun içimizde kalıcı olarak etki bırakacağına inanıyor. So he, in our culture, it's believed that the soul of the fava will be uh, 
embedded inside us. Ve bakla içimizde dirileceğine inanılır. And after that we believe that the father will kind of come back to life inside of us. Ve bundan dolayı dikkatli pişirmek gerekiyor. So because of this you have to be careful while you're preparing this dish. Ayrıca falları var, bakla falı var. There's a fava uh, uh, There's a fava witchcraft. Evet. There's a fava uh, iki tür iki tür bakla var ayrıca. A fava psychic reading. Bir, biri biri Yahudi baklası isim olarak öyle denir. There, there's there's a Jewish uh, fava. It's a, it's a name. Bak, bakla. And others just called fava. Evet. O Yahudi baklasının özelliği acı olması. The Jewish fava The thing about that is it's, it's a little more tangy. O, onlar da böyle e, haşlanıp sokaklarda e, tuzlanıp yenilirdi. Bugün artık ülkemde yok maalesef. So in the past that, the, that type of fava was boiled and served as a street food. But that's again a tradition that's not uh, seen these days. Şimdi e, bakla kavurmasını e, biz iç baklayla yaptık çünkü şu andaki baklalar biz eşek baklası okay. yeriz. So the fava at this time of the year in May because they're large we refer them as donkey favas because they're too big. So that's why we're using the inside of the fava. Çünkü, When they were tender they would have used the actual whole fava. Çünkü dışı kartlaşmış durumda. Because the skin is too uh, stringy and unedible. Şimdi içinden bakla kavurmasını yapacağız. So, yeah, we're going to do show a different way using just the inside of the fava. The, the actual bean. Zeytin yağı olmazsa olmazı. Yeah. <gülüyor> Olive oil is a must. Çok az ku kuzu eti. Bu yani yeah, four, four ounces of tav lamb. Tavuk konulabilir. You can use chicken. Ee, yine dana dana olabilir. You can use uh, beef. Ama böyle daha çok antrikot tarzı bir şey. A, a tender piece of beef evet. would be uh, more suitable for this dish. Ama kuzu kuzu mutlak hani biz e, traditional it's uh, it's evet. uh, preferred in Turkey. Soğan koyarım. So adding the onions of course. Hem kuru soğan var. Hem taze soğan var. So there's some yellow onions and he's going also going to use some spring onions. Biraz tuz. Adding the salt. Black pepper. Biber. And marash pepper. Evet. Garlic. Anybody have any questions? Do I I have a question in terms of the olive oil used. Um <laughs> not not the amount, I won't question the amount of olive oil used. But how um I think as Americans we have less of an education around quality olive oil and what goes into how we can sort of identify quality olive oil. What are um What what can we be looking for, um, and and how can we sort of value olive oil? Zeytinyağı alırken neye bakmamızı önerirsin veya neye tavsiye edersin? Şimdi bir defa mutlak koku. The smell of it is evet. most yani important, of course. Yani re re rengine bakma. And the color. Bir de yani ağzınızda aslında e, ister şarap tadar gibi. Hani dil you have to taste it like a wine. Derin derin nefes alıp hani. Take a deep ya, breath. Bıra bıraktığınız anda daha çok böyle enginar tadı. It has an artichoke Ve type of flavor. Ya karakteristik özelliğini alıyorsanız. And it has a the oil has its own character. Zeytini düşünün, zeytinin yaprağını düşünün, kendi meyvesini düşünün çiğken. Think about it like the olive 
a leaf or an olive while it's when it's raw. The o tat değil de öyle biz zıbar deriz. Yatta zıbar diye bir laf var. Hani çürümüş anlamda aslında ölmüş zeytin sıkılmışsa o mesela şöyle bir şey. So if an olive has fallen from a tree and is kind of bruised the flavor of that will not be the best. It has to be picked and uh, crushed fresh and without it getting all bruised up. Yani o, o koku mesela bir ton içerisinde bir kilo çürük zeytin olursa o, o zeytin yağını yok eder. In a ton of olives, if there's a kilo of olives that is rotten or doesn't have that, it'll ruin the whole batch. Mm -hmm. Yine taze soğan koydum. We added the spring onions. Bir parça da buna. And add a little more salt and pepper, Bir. the marash pepper, black Bir pepper ben. to this. Bunu yediğini yapmıştım ama bunu, bunu baştan sona yapmaya çalışacağım. So we have prepared a finished version of this, but he's going to finish it here on stage for you today, instead of showing the pre-done one. And when would this dish typically be served? Like as, hmm? and when would the dish typically be served? As an entree or as a family meal? An entree olarak mı? Bu yine bu yani sadece bu bu yemek yenir. Yani bu bu. This would be the main dish. This would be the dish by itself. Ana yemek. Yani bunun yanında gerçekten başka yemek yemek. Buna yapılacak en büyük hakaret kültürümüzde. So he believes that eating anything else with this would kind of disrespect this dish by itself. Ve şey mutlaka yufka ekmeğiyle yeriz. And we eat it with a very thin flat bread called yufka that he prepared actually earlier this morning. Ya yufka ve şey daha çok böyle çatal kaşıkla değil sokum deriz biz parça kopartılıp sokum şekli. Tear a piece of bread off. And kind of just dig into the dish straight instead of using a fork and knife. Şunu çok böyle fazla çırpmıyoruz. We don't we don't mix it too much. Just just kind of break up the yellow. saniye kadar hiç e, karıştırmıyoruz. So we don't mix it after this, uh, this step. Let it cook for 10-15 seconds. Can I get a knife please? Çok Hani yumurtanın renkleri mutlak görülmesi gerekiyor. Böyle çıkma, hani omlet gibi falan olmaması gerekiyor. It shouldn't look like omelet, so not mix it too much, and the egg should you should be able to see the eggs in there. En son nane. Fresh mint. Oh, I can smell the fresh fava beans from here. Actually, it's amazing. İçeride buradaki mutfağın koşullarına göre. So upstairs, while we were uh, getting prepared for the presentation today, he made. As you can see, it's similar to a tortilla, but uh, he made it on the stove top. Normalde bıçakla kesmek değil, şöyle. Yeah, kopar. usually we don't use a knife. We just kind of... Bu <laughs> şekil. <laughs> and that's the way we eat it. Perfect.
I feel like I have um, definitely landed into spring now, seeing this dish, the fava beans, the lamb, the mint. It's what? It's spring, yes. It's spring come to life, it feels like. Any questions for Chef while they're going to the next demo? That is, I am not sure, but afterwards you can definitely come down, tear off a piece of bread. Yep. <laughs> my understanding, I am not, I've never had the chance to go to Turkey, but my understanding of Turkish culture is that it is an incredibly hospitable culture. So my guess is that everybody is essentially invited down now to share with this one. So this name's uh, this dish's name is Ali Nazik. Aslında geçen kadın ismiydi yemeklerimiz. Bu sefer erkek ismi. Yeah. So yes or uh, yesterday we our dishes were named after women. Today it's named after a man. <laughs> Ali. Evet, evet. Ali is the name of course. Aslında Nazik sözcüğü hafif anlamına so, gelir. Yani... So I mean in the vocabulary Nazik means uh, very kind but Sen dedin, nazik burada. Hafif, yani in, in this dish it means it's hani light. Hafif yemek it's it's gibi. a light it's a light dish. Evet. Ali nazik means so, uh, for, the, for the cooking it's uh, named that way. Fransız bu yemeği yiyor. Ala na, yani ne diyorlar? Nazik diyorlar. A French person, uh, sorry again, a French person ate this in the region and called it ala nazik. <laughs> Ve bölge insanı alayı çünkü al anlamında alınadığı için so the people in that region, Allah, all means to give. They understood it as all. Ve Ali diyorlar, isim Ali Nazik. And it over time transferred into Ali, the name Ali. So he's crushing some garlic right now. So he's going to saute the garlic with the eggplant. Bunu, uh, and he's doing this with some clarified butter. And why the choice for butter here instead of olive oil? Bundaki zeytinyağı yerine tereyağı kullanmanın bir sebebi var mı? Şimdi bu e, bunda et var hani etli olduğu için. E, e, normalde bunun zeytinyağlısını da yapıyoruz. You can use both, but Ama, he, he preferred to use butter to show a different approach to this dish. <gülüyor> mutlak ve mutlak e, şey, yani patlıcanı yalnız yiyeceksek zeytinyağlı yapıyoruz mesela. If, if you're going to Et have yoksa. it without meat and just do the eggplant, then you do it with olive oil. <gülüyor> Ama e, etliyse, mesela diyelim ki bu e, küçük küçük Kıyılmış kıymalar, yeah. hani. So these are very small cut pieces of meat. Normal makineden çekilmiş kıyma da yapılır. We can also do it with ground lamb or ground beef. Ee, ve e, burada e, mesela bunu közlenmiş patlıcan, domates, biberle birlikte de aynı şey yapılır ama o zeytinyağı ile yapılır. Yeah. So again you can add tomatoes and peppers to the eggplant. But again that version without the meat you would use olive oil. Çok fazla değil. Gözlenmiş patlıcan, mutlak gözlenmiş. So this was some eggplant that was cooked over a charcoal and then the skin was removed of course. Çok örselemeye gerek yok. Hani you just kind of chop it up a little bit. You can do it with a more or with a fork. It's see the same thing. So we're going to let it rest for a second, or a minute. 
And add some more butter. Bir parça zeytin zeytin yağı alabiliriz şimdi. We can kick some olive oil. Varsa, yoksa sorun değil. I got some right here. Az bir şey. Biraz da, biraz da. So he had the olive oil since you asked about it. Çok az kuzu kaburgası. So this is lamb breast. And this, I believe, is some uh, lamb tenderloin. Mesela bu, bu da bu, bu yenirken başka bir şey yanında hani harici bir çorba vesaire yenilmez. Ağustos ayında yapılır. And I'm so sorry to do this but we have just a couple minutes left okay. for the first time. Uh -huh. It's going to come together right now. It seems wrong to rush a sort of traditional culture recipe, and yet. So he's adding the peppers, some more garlic to it. And we had this dish on the first day uh, served out. Some, some of you might have uh, tried it. He's going to show two different types of uh, presentation for it. Böyle de yeniyor çünkü. So you can keep it separate with layers of eggplant, yogurt, and the meat, or have the yogurt and eggplant mixed up like this, and then put the uh, top it off with the meat. Mm -hmm. Would it typically be served with these two different kinds of presentations side by side, or would it sort no. of? No. So yeah. the, he's just showing uh, the ways, trying to give an different. idea of the ways you can serve it. So okay. one is with the yogurt mixed into the eggplant, mm -hmm. and one is, as you say, separate layers of it. Mm -hmm. Chef Musa also made a pita bread this morning. I think that's probably the most beautiful pita bread I've ever seen, actually. You must have some hot chilies with them. And then a little black pepper on top. Perfect. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much again, both Musa and Barack. Um, I'm afraid we are out of time. I will invite you down here in a second. One thing I want to leave, um, one thought I want to leave with all of you, though, is one thing that has really stuck out to me in this uh, session was the use of vegetables for flavor. 
when we think sometimes of eating vegetables or, or plants for um, health reasons or because we're replacing meat. But I think that the chefs in all three of the chefs in the session have shown how they're actually using these plants, um, produce for flavor and building flavor and complexity into the dishes. Um, the other thing is having drawn from cultures, uh, Mexico, India, and Turkey, the ways in which these cultures and traditions lend themselves to the storytelling. I've never heard of fava witchcraft or fava psychics, but I am now going to be much more careful when I eat my fava beans, um, and I encourage you to as well. So please help me um, give one more round of applause to all of our chefs. Um, I welcome you down if you'd like to take a bite. Otherwise, we have lunch going on on the second floor. Thank you. Hi, I'm here to talk about senior living and health care, a very important segment. Using Rich's products, operators are able to offer a variety of customizable meals, higher quality food, and provide impressive selections. Snacks are also very important to seniors. So we have a breadstick that you can make out of our Rich's pizza dough. We also have a Rich's parfait made with layers of our Rich's on top, applesauce, and our crumbled uh, Uber, which we call the ultimate breakfast round or some granola round. Also, using our 6x6 six six Rich's flatbread, you can make a caprese sandwich, which is very, very appealing and tasty. You can also cut this into triangles for a shareable application. Then we also want to talk about the Rich's plant-based cooking cream. This is one of our newest products. It does not contain any of the eight allergens it can make a vegan tomato soup. You start with a little bit of oil and sweat your vegetables till they're tender. Then you add a slurry, some vegetable broth, some crushed tomatoes, and thicken that up. And then you come back and finish it with the plant-based cooking cream for a creamy vegan tomato soup, which goes great with breadsticks and our sandwiches. Using Rich's products, you can cater to that dinner party generation and provide impressive selections. Hi, Chef Jake here from Rich's. I'm here to talk to you today about our new ready to stretch pizza dough. It's unique, authentic, versatile, and flexible. It gives you the opportunity to make beautiful artisan style pizzas by taking dough right from the refrigerator onto the screen stretch it to the thickness you want, and then top it and bake it in whatever oven you have. We have six inch or 12 inch dough. You may buy pizza dough already from Rich's and you say, well, what makes this different? What makes it different is it's ready to stretch right from the fridge. It's authentic, it's unique, and it's ready to stretch to give you that artisan pizza dough that you've been looking for for your operation for years. So let's stretch a pizza. We'll use our, our six inch, six ounce ready to stretch pizza dough we took right from the refrigerator. This eliminates proofing so it makes it easier for the operator to use. I'll stretch our dough without even picking it up and you can make this as thick or thin as you want. I'll, stre I'll stretch this six inch dough to about 12 inches and even if it's not perfectly round it gives it that rustic artisan look. So today we're going to prepare a margarita pizza. I'll take our ready to stretch pizza dough, use a, a small amount of pizza sauce, spread it evenly, and then add our ingredients. I have sliced tomato, fresh mozzarella cheese, and we'll get this right in the oven and bake this. We're going to bake this at a high temperature and we'll see how nice it comes out of, out of the oven. Whether you have a, an impinger oven, whether you have a convection oven, or a wood stone oven, the pizza bakes up perfectly every time. So let's get to the oven. So here's our pizza straight out of the oven. We'll add our basil. And we'll cut it up for our customers to enjoy. We have to remember with this pizza crust, 
the texture is that of real scratch dough without making it from scratch. And I think your guests are going to love it. So there we have it. An artisan pizza made with our richest ready to stretch pizza dough. Remember, no proofing and we get that airy artisan texture with a nice crunchy crust. And I think you're going to love it. So I invite you to take our new ready to stretch pizza dough, serve it to your customers and see what great reaction you have. Hey, thanks for joining me in my kitchen today. I hope to see you again real soon. Hi, I'm here to talk to you about a very competitive segment, college and universities. College students are clamoring for plant-based products and Rich's has a new broccoli and cheese pizza crust and a cauliflower crust. Lots of options you can do with these plant-based crusts. You can, of course, do a pizza, but it makes a great panini, a gluten-free panini. You can also use it as a salad bowl for salads. You can also use it as a gluten-free crust for quiche. You can also do crackers, breadsticks, and gluten-free croutons for salads. The product comes in frozen. It is fully baked. All you need to do is thaw it under refrigeration and see how pliable it is. So you can actually fold it and make paninis out of it. It has a wonderful flavor. In fact, it's college student approved. Here is a dish with spiralized sweet potatoes, clams, and a creamy Asian turmeric sauce. Using a spiralizer, spiralize the sweet potatoes into long, thick noodles. Cook the sweet potatoes in boiling water, stirring gently for about a minute or two. Drain and set aside. Heat the vegetable oil in a wok over medium-low heat. Add the sweet potato noodles. Stir frequently and cook just until tender. Remove from the wok and set aside. In the same wok, add a little oil, add the clams, turn the heat to medium, add the garlic, ginger, and chopped chili pepper. Add coconut milk and no professional liquid concentrate base. Add turmeric and fresh lime juice. Cook until the clams are open, remove, and then set aside. Reduce the broth until it's thick enough to coat a spoon and season to taste. Add the noodles back into the sauce, toss gently, and then add the clams to combine well. Place the noodles and the clams on a plate, sprinkle with furikake, cilantro, and sprouts. Garnish with lime. So here is the finished dish. Enjoy. This is a recipe for beet tartare with a quick cured egg, a modern take on an old classic. Combine the fish sauce, Worcestershire sauce, oyster sauce, honey, hot sauce, garlic cloves, and ground mustard. Gently place the yolks in the marinade. Cover and marinate in the refrigerator for 12 to 24 hours. These beets have been roasted, peeled, and diced. Combine the beets with the mayonnaise, Tabasco sauce, cornichons, capers, and scallions, and toss gently to combine. Season to taste and hold refrigerated. Add a small amount of oil to a cast iron pan. Cut the peeled shallots in half and sear flat side down until they begin to caramelize. Set aside. To plate, use a round cutter to form the beet tartare. Place an egg yolk in the middle. Garnish with brulee shallots, radishes, asparagus spears, dill tops, and microgreens. Finish with dots of Hellman's Real Mayonnaise. Here's our beet tartare with quick cured egg. Enjoy. This is a great dish of pressure caramelized carrots with za'atar mayo, 
candied sunflower seeds, and roasted parsley and carrot top gremoulade. Combine the peeled trimmed carrots with the butter, the baking soda, and a little bit of salt in a pressure cooker. Set the pressure cooker on high pressure for 15 minutes. In the meantime, prepare the gremoulade. Fry the carrot top and parsley leaves in canola oil until translucent and crisp, about 15 seconds. Drain on paper towel and sprinkle with salt. Gently toss the fried leaves with lemon zest and set aside. To prepare the za'atar mayo, combine the mayonnaise with za'atar and freshly squeezed lemon juice. Place in a squeeze bottle and refrigerate until ready to use. To prepare the candied sunflower seeds, heat the seeds in a small nonstick pan for about three minutes. Stir in the brown sugar, stirring constantly over medium heat until seeds are coated and the brown sugar has melted. Place on wax paper, sprinkle with salt, and let cool. To serve, place the warm carrots on a plate, drizzle with a za'atar mayo, top with candied seeds and gremolata. Here is the finished dish. Enjoy. This is a light, refreshing dish featuring sustainable seafood. Alaskan black cod with a grapefruit relish and an avocado cream. In a bowl, whisk together the grapefruit juice, soy sauce, mirin, miso paste, and black pepper. Marinate the cod fillets for up to 30 minutes. For the relish, char the jalapeno over an open flame. Once cooled, seed and mince. Combine with the diced grapefruit segments, scallions, sugar, red wine vinegar, and olive oil. Season to taste and refrigerate until ready to use. To make the avocado cream, combine the avocado, garlic, yogurt, Hellman's light mayonnaise, chili, and lime juice in a blender. Blend until smooth. Heat oil in a nonstick saute pan over medium heat. Pan sear the cod until opaque and beginning to caramelize. To serve, place the avocado cream on the bottom of the plate. Top with the fish and the grapefruit relish. Garnish with microgreens. Here's our finished dish. I hope you enjoy. This dish is a fun take on a classic gratiné, hollandaise crusted cauliflower seasoned with cheese and mustards. Cut the cauliflower into florets, then toss the florets in a mixing bowl with oil, hot sauce, thyme, garlic, salt, and pepper. Place on a sheet pan lined with parchment paper and roast at a 425 degree oven until the florets begin to turn golden brown, about 15 to 20 minutes. Remove and set aside. Meanwhile, combine the panko, parsley, lemon zest, and cheeses, then season with the salt and pepper. Combine the Nor liquid hollandaise sauce with the grainy and Dijon mustards. Place the roasted cauliflower in a preheated cast iron pan, top with the hollandaise sauce, and sprinkle with the breadcrumb mixture. Roast for another 10 minutes or until the breadcrumbs are golden brown. Here is the finished dish. Enjoy.